Matthew 24. There is a storm warning in Scripture as Jesus gives his end of the world teachings in Matthew 24 and 25. The global map shows a storm front on its way. And our text tells of something pretty astounding that happens during the Great Tribulation. And that is the gospel reaching all of the earth which still exists at that time in a short space of time. What the church has failed to do for 2,000 years will be accomplished quickly during the tribulation, during a lull in the storm. Look at verse 14, where we left off last time in our End of the World series, Matthew 24, 14. Jesus said, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Do not mistake this for him saying that that happens before the rapture. This happens after the rapture and during the Great Tribulation. And somewhere just after the midpoint of the tribulation specifically. <clears throat> Don't allow your mind to become dull to the fact that Jesus is coming back and that this world is coming to an end. Just because we've heard so much about it for so long and it hasn't happened yet. <clears throat> let's remember that we're closer to the rapture than any humans who have ever existed in all of history. It's an exciting place we fill in history right now. And when that happens, it ushers out all who've been born again and ushers in a great storm of the tribulation. Will anyone be saved during the tribulation? The clear answer is yes, but not you. I mean, not one single person in this room will be saved during the tribulation because not one single person in this room or listening to this right now can, can be saved during the great tribulation. And yet many will. Um, why no one here? Because the Bible says very clearly in multiple places that anybody who heard the gospel and did not receive it rejected the gospel prior to the rapture will enter the great tribulation and will be sent strong delusion and they will believe a lie and they will forever be damned. It will be too late for them to be saved. Just as those who beat on the door of the ark, it was too late for them. That door was already closed. They could have gone in while it was open. When the sky began to fall, it was too late. They had had warning. They had heeded the storm warning. And yet many who've never heard the gospel will be saved during the Great Tribulation. And this is what Jesus is speaking of in verse number 14. Um, you know, the first half of the Tribulation will be bad enough because all the Christians are removed, all the salt is removed from preserving the earth, and, um, and that means all the Holy Spirit is gone within the hearts of believers. Add to that the hysteria we talked about last time, over millions suddenly missing, including all little children. Hysteria. The war, the famine, the disease, the natural disasters we spoke of. The chaos. The looting. You see what happens looting-wise even in the United States of America when just a minor setback happens. Imagine when all the systems go down, the lawlessness. Let me tell you something about the police. I love the police. I think we should support the police. But it's very understandable what the police will do when bad things happen on this earth. When the end comes, they take off and they take care of their own. They take care of their own family. They do not show up for work. Nobody does. Doctors, nurses, they do not go in. Grocery workers. And why would they? The truck drivers aren't driving at that point, so there's nothing being delivered. Gas stations. Oh, well, I'll just pull out my smartphone and dial up Amazon. No, you will not. Everything will be completely gone and upside down. 
But there will be a lull during this big storm, the perfect storm of the ages, brewing on the horizon even now. But there will be a lull during the Great Tribulation for a brief period of time. We're not sure exactly how long. Now we need to go over to Revelation 7 to fill in the blanks. The same Jesus helped John fill in the blanks of what he meant when he spoke to John in person in Matthew 24. So go over to Revelation 7. Right now we're going to spend the rest of our time there. Turn to the back of your Bible right now, Revelation 7. And as you find Revelation 7, we're looking at verse number 1, which says, And after these things, I, that's John, saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. This is the lull in the storm. Hold back the winds. The four corners of the earth, the four winds, this is symbolism here. This is a reference to the compass the four quadrants of the earth, the four points on the globe, north, south, east, and west, and the angel is keeping the wind from blowing. It's a literal wind, perhaps, but I think it's a symbolic wind, most of all. Uh, many times throughout the Bible, Old Testament and New, wind is used symbolically for judgment. On the screen, you can see some examples. Proverbs 127, when your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction, we're talking about the tribulation now, cometh as a what? A whirlwind. Distress and anguish. Hosea 8, 7, they have sown the wind, they shall reap the whirlwind. Hosea 13, 15 speaks of an east wind coming, the wind of the Lord coming from the wilderness, among other examples. And here in Revelation 7, where you're turned, these four angels are holding back God's winds of judgment for a while, with God's permission or at His instruction, momentarily or for a brief time, because God wants to do something very important. And the trials of the tribulation stop or, or wane to some extent, if only for a moment. So there's the symbolism of Jesus' teaching here. Now I want you to see the sealed here, the sealed in Revelation 7. In verse number 2 it says, And I saw another angel, this is a fifth angel, ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. That's bringing judgment. Saying, Stop, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their forehead. Verse 4, And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed, how many? 144,000 of all the tribes of children of Israel. And then the next four verses name 12,000 out of each of the 12 tribes. Um, to seal them in their foreheads, these 144,000 witnesses. By the way, if you read carefully these next four verses, one of the tribes is missing. It's the tribe of Dan. Jacob's blessing, Jacob, when he blessed the, his 12 children, his blessing on Dan was unlike the other 11. It was a negative blessing. Now, we can't say this for sure, uh, by the way, the tribe of Levi was plugged into Dan's place then uh, for all time. Perhaps the false prophet of Revelation will come from the tribe of Dan. That's a possibility. Anyway, in every age, God has never been without witnesses on the earth. And isn't it fascinating that there will even be witnesses on the earth during the Great Tribulation after all the saved people are removed? He will still be giving a chance to some, in fairness, who we had never reached. By the way, we're supposed to try to reach them. And we probably could reach them, but we're far too comfortable. But God has never been without witnesses in any age. There's always been a faithful remnant. My mind goes back to back in the Old Testament in Elijah's day, when the prophet Elijah thought that he was the only one left serving God and reminded him, I got seven more, 7,000 more 
like you out there. Well, this will be true in the tribulation. God's spokesman. It won't be me. It won't be you. If you've been saved, that great spiritual vacuum will be created at the rapture. And at some point in the tribulation, that vacuum will be filled by 144,000 Jewish evangelists, soul winners they will be, 12,000 from each tribe. Now, there's always been fanatical groups who've said, we're part of God's chosen people in that text. Uh, Fanatical groups who claim to be the 144,000, pretty absurd thought, quite ridiculous, The most well-known, of course, are the Jehovah's Witnesses who had to revise all of their teachings and all of their paperwork when after many, many decades of claiming it, their numbers finally climbed above 144,000. They had to change their doctrine. Another little problem, they're not Jewish. And the 144,000 have to be Jewish. Well, many Bible scholars speculate about how these people get saved after the rapture, during the tribulation. Let me just answer it for you. I don't know. I don't know. We can't know everything. Uh, Really, nobody knows. We can't have an answer for everything. There are some things in Revelation we just can't figure out. Another example is at the Battle of Armageddon, when Jesus defeats everyone with just a word... There will be so many people gathered there in the valley of Megiddo in Israel. In that valley that the Bible says that the blood will run as deep as a horse's bridle, so several feet high, um, for 200 miles. I don't understand how many people could be gathered there, how a war could be so horrendous. But I believe it. We can't understand everything. We can't have all the answers. Great preacher of yesteryear, J. Vernon McGee, used to say comically, some people think they know what that blood type will be. (laughs) We can't know everything about what Revelation uh, says. Some people think they'll get saved by gospel literature that's left behind. Um, I'm certainly trying to pump out as much onto the internet as I can, as if people will have much internet access then. You've heard of the group Left Behind, who named their group that in their books that, based on the the whole premise is let's produce printed literature to leave behind to our loved ones so they can understand what's happened when we disappear. Now, um, they should be witnessing to their loved ones now, and... um, And if they have been, then their chance is only now. But for many others, perhaps they will get a hold of some of that literature that they'd never seen or heard of before. Others speculate that people will get saved during the tribulation the same way that the Apostle Paul was, through a personal appearance of Jesus Christ. Got no evidence of that. It's just speculation. I tend to think, if I had a guess, that people will put two and two together when the Christians all depart, And people will study the Bible for the first time and believe and be converted. And I think they'll be guided by these witnesses that God seals, 144,000 of them. It's really the only thing we do know for sure is they'll be like 144,000 Billy Grahams running all over this globe, helping guide some people to the mercy of God, even when the storm is brewing and even as the sky is falling. Did you notice in verse 3 it said they were sealed, sealed in their foreheads? Whether that's visible or not, we don't know. What we do know is that this seal guarantees them God's protection. God's protection until His purpose in their life is fulfilled. And then the Bible makes it clear they'll be killed at that time. But until then, though Satan hates them and the Antichrist will loathe them and many will want to put them to death, they would be annihilated if it was in humans' power uh, in short order. But because they are sealed, they are stamped, private property of God, nothing can touch them during this time. They're guaranteed protection until God's done with them. Hey, I'm happy to report to you that you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of God if you've been saved. And until God's through with you, nothing can touch you either. 
It's the same seal. It's the same stamp Ephesians 4 and verse 30 speaks about. You know, I can look back over the years of my life and see times when Satan made a bid for my life. How many others here in the room could raise your hand and say the same thing? Yeah. Um, if not for God's protective hand, we'd not be here today. I've told you some of my stories. I won't go through those again. But my guardian angel should receive hazard pay. And I bet some of you feel the same way. Had a close friend of mine uh, in our church in Illinois, uh, a deacon there who fell through the ice. And um, when people talked to him later about that, they said, how did you get out? And his answer was, I don't know. I don't know. I wasn't supposed to get out. Even more powerful to me was uh, a little girl who was found on Lake Wapapello near our home there on a tree stump. Up in the middle of the lake was a tree stump sticking up. And she was found there uh, by the fish and wildlife people, I think is who found her, uh, sitting there. And she was just sitting there alone, little girl. Within the next few days, her parents were found drowned on the other side of the lake, big lake. When asked how she got on the stump, she said, a man in a white robe picked me up and set me on it. It's really hard to argue things like that, isn't it? It's really hard to explain that in some other way, even if we wanted to. Now, I am not saying that we are invincible not at all. I may die during this message. And if I do, one thing's for certain, God was through with me. And I'm okay with that. I'm protected by God from start to finish, whenever that would be. God's purposes will be totally and completely fulfilled in your life, Christian. You say, yeah, but when I say goodbye to someone, I'm never ready for him to go. Sometimes they're too young, too. We're just admitting our purposes were not fulfilled in them. What the Bible says is that God's purposes were fulfilled in them. Well, that seal guarantees the 144,000 people protection as his witnesses. And then look at the people getting saved Verse number 9. You're still in Revelation 7. Verse number 9. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. Skip down to verse 13. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. That's like saying, Search me. <laughs> Maybe you know. I don't know. Uh, continuing on, verse 14, he said to me, These are they which came out of what? Great tribulation. And have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. This group is not just Jews. All kindreds, all nations, all peoples. A massive group from every tongue. Though we're not told specifically who they are, most scholars agree. These are the fruits of the witnessing who were just mentioned in the previous verses. And uh, they got saved. They believed during the tribulation. And they were killed then for their faith in Christ. If you believe during the tribulation, 100%, you will be killed for that faith. You have to refuse to worship the beast. That means that they refuse to take uh, the mark of the beast refuse to bow to the Antichrist, and it costs them their heads. They die in great numbers at the guillotine. 
Now let's be clear once again. No one in this room today will be saved during the tribulation. When you reject the truth, you receive a lie. If you die in your state of rejecting the truth and not accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior and being born again and, and getting saved, when you reject the truth, you receive a lie. And to just say, I don't know yet, I'm just going to wait, is to say no. And that is to receive a lie as well. Truth is not something you can put in your hip pocket and save for later. You use it or you lose it. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, in verse 11, it says, For this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. So it doesn't matter if all 144,000 witnesses go to you during the tribulation, if you are still here because you said no to God before the rapture, you will still believe the Antichrist lie. God will send you strong delusion. Matthew 24, 24 says... If it were possible, the Antichrist would deceive the very elect. He would deceive a saved person. That's how strong this delusion would be. It's just an example. And yet some say, well, I'm going to go my own way. And God says, okay, and gives him a shove in that direction. And says, I'll let you have what you want. We'll see if you want what you get. Some say, I'm just going to wait and see if it all comes to pass. I'll see if it's true. And if it's true, if it all comes to pass, then I'll get saved. Listen, if you won't get saved now, then you wouldn't get saved then. If you won't get saved right now in these days of grace, when everything is working for you getting saved, you won't get saved in that day when everything is working against you. This is not a second chance for those who have already rejected the gospel. It's a final and only chance for those who'd never heard. And now look at the scene in heaven in verse number 11. And all the angels stood round about the throne, about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Say that word with me, please. Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. <clears throat> Amen. The Bible says that without ceasing, there are some gathered around the throne for all eternity, crying day and night, holy, holy, holy. And they can do it for a billion years and have not scratched the surface of what eternity is, and have not scratched the surface on how holy that He is. And we who are saved, and these saved in the tribulation, imagine the privilege of being saved in the great tribulation. The scene in heaven. While a storm is going on down below, there's amening and hooping and hollering at the incredible mercy of God. Yeah, that's true, folks. We're going to get carried away when we get carried away. We're going to let the glory roll when the roll is called in glory. I'm going to get beside myself when I get beside the king. We're going to have the time of our life when the time of our life is over. Nothing wrong with getting excited about the Lord, by the way, folks. I'm talking to you Baptists out there. <laughs> Sometimes around here I wonder if people think amens are billed at $50 each. They're free. You say, well, I think church should be dignified. Listen, if you're talking about things being done decently and in order, that is what the Bible says about church business. But this isn't about business. This is about praise. And our God is worthy of that. Some people don't know the difference between dignity and rigor mortis. Skip down to verse 16. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and read the last phrase aloud with me. Ready? 
and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Now these are the martyrs. These are the martyrs who've been beheaded by the guillotine, killed for their faith during the tribulation. They will have tears, but those tears won't last long. And it's not only the martyrs that God wipes the tears from, because in the end of the book of Revelation, it says of us, God shall wipe away all tears from our eyes. Some of the tenderest memories of childhood are having my tears dried by mom or dad. And we had the same experience with our kids when they were at that age. They'd act so pitiful if they're spanked or whatever. Crocodile tears would sometimes take them places with us, and you just want to shut it off, right? How do I turn off this, the valve? Where's the valve on this? How do you get someone to stop crying? You want to wipe away tears. It breaks your heart to see someone cry. It breaks our God's heart to see the tears of his children. We had one of our kids, I won't tell you which one, who would wail like we were selling her into slavery. <laughs> Don't you look forward to the day when you can sit on the knee of your heavenly father and he just wipes it dry wipes it all away the tears of every injustice that you've suffered made right every problem gone every question answered explained every tear wiped away and it touches my heart right now as I cry some tears <laughs> that God does not delegate that job of wiping away tears to any angel he does it himself God himself shall wipe all tears from their eyes I look forward to that day do you? Do you know that you'll be there on that day? Because if you're here, the Bible's giving us a storm warning. Because that same God who would wipe the tears from your eyes loves you so much that he wants to save your soul today while he still can. Because on that day, the door of the ark is shut and the sky falls. See the signs of the times. Get saved. Get right if that's what you need. If you're away from him, though, uh, born again, but away from him, get it right. And then let's get busy working and worshiping and walking in his ways, watching for him, watching for the return of our Lord. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, Thank you for how you love the little children that you sat on your lap. You called them to you and said, of such is the kingdom of heaven. And we come full circle to the eternal state when we realize that there we will be, your child, on that same knee. I pray for someone to be saved because of the truth of the gospel today, just as multitudes will be saved after the rapture. We pray, Lord, for a great awakening by your mercy that you give us the privilege of seeing some great revival before the end begins. But Lord, today we pray for one. And I pray that you'd answer that, that you'd knock on their heart's door, that they'd say yes and throw it open wide and let you in. And now, Lord, help us to go forth from this place sealed as your witnesses, accomplishing your purposes until you're through with us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. As we stand to our feet, as the music begins to play, this altar is open. If you need to be saved, would you come? Let us know. 
and we'll pair you up with someone who will go out in a private room with the Bible, pray with you, help you receive the Lord today. Maybe you're at home watching this. If you need to be saved, let us know. We'll help you. And God will do the saving.